Handling Committee and an eminent jurist. Manu Singhvi is also one of the petitioners who has challenged CAA in the Supreme Court. Mr. Singhvi, thank a lot, thanks a lot for your time. I begin by asking you, given the government's detailed response on the pleas against CAA, what is the argument according to you to still deem this act unconstitutional? Uh, let me start by saying firstly that precisely because I am one of the lead counsel, I don't really want to discuss the merits in the way you want to because I am a counsel and I don't think it's right for me to discuss it. Uh, we can't have the court battle outside of the court on media. Hmm. Second, uh, today was a housekeeping hearing. It's good of you to try and educate your viewers, but today was a housekeeping hearing. And third, in that housekeeping hearing, it emerged that after months despite a deadline given to the government of India to file appropriate responses on affidavit, they took time and the order so records, having not filed on in, in time. The learned uh, Solicitor General said so. And I think the urgency of the whole matter was appreciated by the bench, which said that they should have filed earlier, but nevertheless now gave time on the 6th of December. Fourthly, without going into the merits in an argumentative sense, let me tell you hmm. that... Uh, a lot of issues. See, uh, before that, uh, let me also add that there cannot be this kind of a question. Why can't there be a consensus on the law? Mm -hmm. There is a law passed. Obviously, the law is passed by majority. Obviously, the majority law prevails. It's the law of the land. But equally, you must understand the mechanics and the system. It is under challenge in the court of law. Sure. Now, there's no question of consensus in the court of law because in, in a sense, you'd be suggesting that either we withdraw the challenge or the government changes the bill. No, no, that consensus so there, debate that, that, is for my other guests who will be joining me, politically yes. speaking, after the government's yes. very stated so, response. So there uh, will be a consensus, as you put it in your question. This will be either upheld by the court, it will be either partially struck down, or it will be wholly struck down, and in that sense modified by the court, depending on what view they take. But now coming to your question on the merits, all I'd like to say is that there are serious issues of constitutional law arising. Right. To give an example, one issue is clearly of classification. Can you classify in a manner which is geographically limited, applies only to a few countries? The Tamilians today raised an issue about Sri Lankan Tamils. How included them? There was an argument today by counsel for the Tamil Nadu government. <clears throat> the, apart from uh, uh, geographical classification, the other is the issue of religious classification. Can you have a law so tailored which draws a line, firstly, geographically, excluding some from the line, including some. Similarly, a second line, religiously, excluding several religions and giving the benefit to several other religions. Hmm. Now, the test in law is that such lines can be drawn only if there is a very reasonable, very transparent Precisely. nexus with the object sought to be achieved. Now, one object stated by the government is that you have minorities in the stated countries. And they comprise mainly Hindus and other similar minorities. But equally, there are large segments which are in other countries, minorities, which are not included. There are Ahmadiyas, there are, uh, you know, uh, other Shia groups, as somebody said about Tamil Nadu. And there are different countries which have suffered on this account, which are not included. So the ultimate bottom line would be for the court to decide whether the geographical line drawn, whether the religious line drawn, bears a reasonable nexus to the object sought to be achieved. Okay. So can and I then come there in? are also issues of uh, Tripura, in particular, uh, from Bengal in particular, which are a second segment of the case. So I think there's a lot to be dealt with. The government, in fact, has not filed full replies on time. And I think we look forward to the hearing on 6th or shortly thereafter when the hearing will yeah. come. Well, we do hope that, of course, the legal battle will now pick up pace because everybody wants an end to this matter, as you said. It will be decided one way or the other. But on the issue of classification, I just for the benefit of my viewers do want to mention that the government has quoted Article 6 of the Constitution, uh, which had initially allowed migrants who came into India from Pakistan, including present-day Bangladesh, as citizens uh, till a cut-off date. And even those you know, who had come after six months or had been in resident uh, in India for at least six months before the date of registration, even those citizens were allowed to be deemed Indian citizens. So there is a special class of migrants post-partition which clearly took on the basis of religious lines and create, resulted in large-scale migration on religious lines as citizens of India due to very special circumstances. But I move on. You don't want to, of course, talk about the legal angle here because this is going to be debated in the court. I want to ask you, Abhishek Manu Singh, we fundamentally those opposed to CAA, how will they justify their stand 
given the hardships religious minorities, particularly Hindus, Sikhs, etc., face in these neighbor countries. And especially when Syria clearly doesn't take away anything else from an Indian citizen, even the other persecuted minorities from the Muslim communities in these countries can come to India on a case-to-case basis. You are one of those people who has talked about the plight of Hindus, Sikhs and others in these countries. How do you justify politically, in a civic manner, the opposition to this act? I don't think any of the challenges is to the inclusion of Hindus or other minorities like Sikhs. It is to the exclusion of other groups. Nobody is suggesting that the inclusion of certain minorities in those respective countries is wrong. What we are saying is that that is a partial inclusion. The, the ambit must be expanded. Secondly, the test is not persecution, which might have a valid test, as, for example, refugee law provides. The test is purely religious, only selected minorities in those countries, leaving out many, as I said. Or the test is purely geographical. There also the boundaries are drawn uh, very arbitrarily. The government says that even if they apply these persecuted religious minorities, there is a process. It's not like willy-nilly it is given to anybody who may come. Absolutely. But this particular amendment, you're right. The amendment uh, gives it in a large sense to those who establish their, their status. But the qualifying condition is merely religion. While but are other Muslims religions? who are religiously or Both otherwise persecuted in these countries on the same plane as other religious minorities like Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists and others? Are they on the same plane? No, no. no. There, there are, first of all, many minorities, many minorities who claim persecution. I gave you two examples. Subsects of Shias, Tamilians, uh, the, the, the Rohingyas. There are so many more. Those are not addressed. I can understand there's a mechanism to say we will address them, but there is a per se exclusion. Secondly, you see, in the name of the CAA, hmm. do you know the actual thing on the ground? Tripura and Assam are two major petitioners hmm. because the actual result on the ground has been actually loss of citizenship. It has been because you are occasionally for political rhetoric or otherwise, but frequently combining it with national registers of, of citizenship. You are excluding large numbers of people who may have been actually settled here. So this is this whole thing comes as a package. Okay. okay. And you can't disentangle the NRC from the CAA or vice versa. I'm not it's going to go into that because I don't have clear. really the government's position on that as far as this affidavit is concerned. But that's really not an di- argument against the, this act per se. And that can, brings me You're to right. my final question to you. You You're have right. also said that there is anger, fear and mistrust amongst the people and the centre is responsible for creating such an atmosphere among them. But my question to you is, let's say there are fears over NRC and CAA combined, National Register, etc. plus what you've talked about. There are other ways to address that. Are we not throwing the baby out with the bath water to ask for the CAA itself to be cancelled? On the contrary, I would say that in a functioning democracy of which we are proud, India, in a functioning constitutional system, the most dynamic in the world, in a system where we have very bright and very dynamic judiciary, the correct way is to throw up a legal challenge that is totally democratic, that is totally constitutional. How can you suggest that there should not even be a challenge? There are people who have grievances. They may lose, they may win. But the ventilation of those grievances by established democratic processes is in fact a catharsis for democracy. Fair it enough. is in fact the right outlet for democracy. I have no objections and to the legal you know, uh, opposition to this case. To try and suppress that or try and prevent that itself would be a outpouring of grievance. So I think the right thing is this. And as a matter of fact, this challenge should have been heard months or years ago. Okay. But now that it is coming up, we should welcome it. Why should you say that let there be a consensus, let the challenge not go on, let the challenge be withdrawn, let the challenge be thwarted uh, or settled? I'm not saying that the challenge should be withdrawn. Of course, the legal battle should go ahead. We all welcome the fact that it is finally picking, 